Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and this video is about uterus and ovaries ultrasound probe positions. On the left side is a schematic diagram showing ultrasound probe position. These dotted lines are the right and left coastal margins. This is the umbilicus. This white box is the ultrasound probe and this red dot is the indicator or the orientation marker. This is the inguinal region. At this point is the symphysis pubis. For scanning the uterus, we place the probe between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis joint. This is the hypogastric region. It is also called suprapubic region. Place the probe in the midline in longitudinal orientation. The patient's bladder must be full for transabdominal scanning. After locating the bladder, you will find the uterus posterior to it. Here is the endometrium and this is the cervix. You can also rest one end of the probe on the symphysis pubis to get better views of the uterus. Tilt the probe accordingly to scan the uterus completely. For scanning and measuring the endometrium, try to keep the probe parallel to the uterus. Heel-toe movements of the probe can be performed to align the probe with the uterus. This type of angling towards the patient's head is heel movement. For an antiverted uterus or antiflexed uterus, you can use the heel movement to align the probe parallel to the uterus. For a retroverted or retroflexed uterus, use toe movement. The probe is angled towards the patient's feet and this will align the probe properly with the uterus. To scan the lateral aspects of the uterus, move the probe laterally towards both the left and right sides and you will get this image. This is the lateral aspect of the uterus. Now, we will see how to scan the ovaries. The ovaries don't have a fixed position, but locating the internal iliac vessels is a good landmark to locate the ovaries. First, we will see the right ovary. Move the probe laterally and slightly oblique like this to locate the right ovary. We will get this image. It is showing the ovary in longitudinal view. In a similar way, move towards the left side to scan the left ovary in longitudinal plane. We will get this type of image. This is the left ovary. Next, we will scan the uterus in transverse view. Place the probe in the midline and rotate it 90 degrees anti-clockwise to keep it in transverse orientation. Tilt it superiorly and inferiorly to completely scan the uterus from the fundus to the vagina. This type of image will be formed. We can see the uterus in the middle and also the right and left ovaries on the sides. Now, move laterally in this manner to scan the right ovary by using the bladder as a window. You will find the right ovary at this location. You can rotate the probe in an oblique orientation if there is some difficulty in locating the ovary. Now you can move to the left side to scan the left ovary in transverse view. 
This is the left ovary near the uterus in transverse plane. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and in this video we will learn how to take uterus measurements on ultrasound. These measurements are of an adult non-pregnant uterus. In the longitudinal view we can measure the length and the AP thickness of the uterus. One caliper is placed at the top of the fundus and the other caliper is placed at the base of the cervix. The length of the uterus is around 7.5 centimeters approximately. The thickness is around 2.5 centimeters. In the transverse view, we can measure the width of the uterus. We can also see the right and left ovaries. The normal uterine width is around 5 centimeters. These images are taken in transvaginal view. In the longitudinal view, one caliper is placed here at the top of the fundus and the other caliper is placed at the end of the cervix right here. The thickness can be measured by placing the calipers in this manner. And in the transverse view, taken transvaginally, we can measure the width of the uterus. The uterus weighs around 30 to 40 grams. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and today we will discuss uterus positions on ultrasound such as antiverted, retroverted, antiflexed and retroflexed. When the term version is used, it refers to the angle of the cervix and when the term flexion is used, it refers to the angle of the uterine body. The first image is the antiverted uterus. It is the most common uterine position in which the cervix faces or tilts anteriorly. And there is no bending of the body of the uterus, so that's why we do not comment on it. We just talk about the cervix. And on the right side is the retroverted uterus. Here you can notice the cervix is facing posteriorly or downwards in this image. And again, there is no noticeable bend of the body of the uterus, so we do not really comment on it. In antiflex uterus, the body of the uterus will face anteriorly. There will be a bend. And this angle will face towards the bladder, that is anteriorly. And in retroflex uterus, there will be a bend in the uterine body. This angle will face posteriorly, away from the bladder. Here we notice two things, that's why we use two terms. Antiverted. The cervix is facing anteriorly, or in this image, it is facing upward. And antiflexed. The body of the uterus is bending anteriorly. The bladder is supposed to be here in the top left corner of the image. And here we have the antiverted and retroflexed. The cervix is again facing upward anteriorly, and the body of the uterus is bending away from the bladder that is posteriorly. Here you can see the bladder on the top left corner of the image and the uterus is bending away. Another feature is that the, in retroflex the fundus or the body will appear in the right side of the image. In retroverted and retroflex uterus the cervix is tilted posteriorly and the body of the uterus is also facing posteriorly and here we can see it in the right side of the image because the bladder will be appearing in the top left side or the left side of the image 
The cervix is not very clear in this image. That's why we can use a combination of transabdominal and transvaginal views to determine the actual location of the uterus. And here we have the antiverted and anti-flexed uterus. You can see that it is the fundus is in the left side of the image because it's bent facing anteriorly and the cervix is also facing upward so it is antiverted and the body is folded and facing anteriorly hello everyone this is dr sam and today we will discuss uterus ultrasound normal and abnormal appearances we have two views the longitudinal view and the transverse view in the longitudinal view we see the most detail the three layers of the uterus the endometrium is the innermost layer and the myometrium is the thick muscular middle layer and the perimetrium is the outermost layer of the uterus the top portion of the uterus is called fundus and the lower end where it ends in junction with the vagina this junction is called the cervix and in the transverse view this is the appearance of the uterus below, below the bladder in the transvaginal view we see a more detailed information of the uterus we can see a zoomed in view giving us more detail like the endometrium is seen more clearly and this is the fundus on the top portion and the cervix on the bottom portion and also the myometrium is seen very clearly endometritis is the inflammation of the endometrium we can notice the difference in the appearance of the endometrium it is more thickened it has fluid collections giving it a more heterogeneous appearance we must correlate the symptoms as well to rule out other diseases of the uterus endometrial fluid collections can result from a variety of causes and it has like three different types of fluids one is the simple fluid which will be anechoic completely black in appearance then we have the hemorrhagic fluid which can have internal echoes due to clotted blood and blood products we can also have pus collection due to infections which will also give like internal echoes and septations giving it a heterogeneous fluid collection endometrial polyps are benign nodular overgrowths of the endometrium and they appear as rounded polypoid mass inside the endometrial canal they appear as homogeneous and echogenic lesions inside the endometrial canal and we can see that it has fluid collection as well so they are also associated with fluid collections endometrial carcinoma is the malignant condition of the endometrium it gives us a heterogeneous appearance with thickened endometrium showing irregularities in its texture another important feature of endometrial carcinoma is the disruption of subendometrial halo this halo is present in the innermost layer of the myometrium which is right behind the endometrium this hypoechoic area this is the subendometrial halo in carcinoma endometrial carcinoma if there is disruption of this subendometrial halo it leads to myometrial involvement means the carcinoma has reached the myometrium endometrial hyperplasia is the abnormal thickening of the endometrial glands which will lead to endometrial thickening in premenopausal women if the thickening exceeds 15 millimeters it is considered endometrial hyperplasia and in postmenopausal women 
if the thickening exceeds 8 millimeters it is also considered as endometrial hyperplasia uterine fibroids also known as leiomyomas are benign tumors of the uterus they are divided into different types based on their location within the uterus the most common type is the intramural fibroid this fibroid is present in the myometrium of the uterus it mostly appears as hypoechoic but it can also be isoechoic or hyperechoic the subserosal fibroid will protrude out of the uterus it will also give a hypoechoic appearance most of the time the submucosal fibroid will involve the endometrium but if it's large enough it can also involve the myometrium pedunculated fibroid is also present in the endometrial canal but it is connected to the endometrium by a stalk we can see the blood flow within the stalk on the doppler scan and this one has some calcifications which is giving posterior acoustic shadowing adenomyosis is the presence of endometrial tissue within the myometrium it consists of this typical appearance called the venetian blind pattern which has alternate bright and dark bands that's why it's called the venetian blind pattern because of the alternate bright and dark regions dark bands present in the myometrial area it can also have cystic striations as well as irregular endometrial and myometrial junction myometrial cysts and subendometrial cysts can also be seen and the usual heterogeneous texture can also be appreciated in adenomyosis lipoleomyoma is a benign fat containing tumor of the uterus it is hyperechoic due to fat hello everyone this is dr sam and today we will study endometrial thickness on ultrasound throughout the menstrual cycle the appearance of the endometrium and its thickness will change the endometrium is scanned in the longitudinal plane using a transvaginal approach the first phase is the menstrual phase in which the endometrial thickness is between 2 to 4 millimeters and there may be some amount of fluid present which is normal in the second image we have early proliferative phase in which the endometrial thickness is between 5 to 7 millimeters the endometrium just appears as a hyperechoic stripe the menstrual phase image is used just for comparison with the other phases now we have late proliferative phase in which the thickness can be up to 11 millimeters and here we have three distinct layers the innermost central hyperechoic line followed by a hypoechoic middle zone and the outermost hyperechoic basilar layer this appearance is known as trilaminar or triple layered here we have another image of a late proliferative phase this appearance also has another name and that is called the sandwich sign in the secretory phase we may see the maximum thickness of the endometrium it can be between 7 to 16 millimeters and it will appear hyperechoic smooth and homogeneous here we have another image of the endometrium in the secretory phase 
the thickness lies between 7 to 16 millimeters appears smooth hyperechoic and homogeneous here we have an image of the endometrium in a postmenopausal woman there are no more menstrual cycles so the endometrial thickness is usually less than 5 millimeters and it will appear smooth and homogeneous hello everyone this is dr sam and in this video we will discuss first trimester pregnancies and ectopic pregnancies the first image is the non-gravid uterus which means there is no pregnancy we can see the endometrium not containing any structure on the right side is the gravid uterus it has a gestational sac this gestational sac is usually visualized at three to five weeks of gestational age a pseudo gestational sac is a fluid collection in the uterus which can mimic a real gestational sac the main differentiating feature is that it is located centrally in the endometrial cavity rather than being implanted in the endometrium and sometimes it may be surrounded by a thick decidual layer the double decidual sac sign is a useful indicator of early pregnancy when the embryo and yolk sac are not seen it consists of two layers the outer layer is the decidua parietalis which is lining the uterine cavity and the inner layer lining the gestational sac is the decidua capsularis mean sac diameter is the measurement of the gestational sac it is measured by taking two measurements in the longitudinal view and one measurement in the transverse view we add these three values up and divide the result by three we get the mean sac diameter now if the mean sac diameter is 16 to 24 millimeters and there is no visualization of the embryo it may mean that it is a failed pregnancy but it is not confirmed but if the mean sac diameter is more than 25 millimeters and still there is no visualization of embryo then it is a failed pregnancy the yolk sac is the first structure visualized in the gestational sac it is an echogenic structure with an echoic center and is usually seen around the gestational age of 5.5 to 7 weeks the crown rump length is the longest dimension of the embryo it is the most accurate method used for measuring gestational age it is measured by placing the caliper on the head of the embryo and the other caliper on the end of the body of the embryo if the crl is more than seven millimeters cardiac activity should be noted here is another image showing us how to calculate the crown rump length fetal heart rate can be measured by using the m mode the normal heart rate range is from 120 to 160 beats per minute and it may reach 170 beats per minute by 10 weeks fetal bradycardia occurs when the heart rate is below 100 beats per minute and fetal tachycardia occurs when the heart rate exceeds 170 to 180 beats per minute 170 is the borderline range for tachycardia physiologic gut herniation is a normal occurrence in the first trimester around six to eight weeks there is bulging of the intestines of the embryo this is because the bowel of the embryo is growing much faster than the abdominal cavity but by 12 to 13 weeks 
it will return to its normal appearance. Another normal occurrence in the first trimester is the rhombin cephalon. It is seen around 8 to 10 weeks and occurs as a hypoechoic region in the posterior part of the embryonic head and it becomes the fourth ventricle by 11 weeks. Now we will move on to ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic pregnancies occur outside the uterine cavity. Based on their location, there are different types of ectopic pregnancies. Amongst these, the tubal ectopic is the most common. These occur in the fallopian tubes. Here we can locate the fallopian tubes by first finding the ovary and we can see this connection which leads to the fallopian tube and there is a gestational sac inside the fallopian tube so from here we can see that this is a tubal ectopic pregnancy the next type is the interstitial ectopic pregnancy it occurs in the upper uterine horns the gestational sac is away from the endometrium and the gestational sac is surrounded by myometrium and endometrium this is called the endomyometrial mantle one feature of interstitial ectopic is the interstitial line sign it is an echogenic line that is connecting the gestational sac to the endometrium cervical ectopic is a rare form of ectopic pregnancy in which there is a gestational sac in the endocervical canal normally the pregnancy should be located here in the endometrial canal implanted inside the endometrium but it is in the cervical region Ovarian ectopic is a very rare form of ectopic pregnancy in which the gestational sac will be located inside the ovary. Here we can notice a gestational sac with a small embryo located within the ovary. It is a very rare form of ectopic pregnancy. Heterotopic pregnancy occurs when there is a presence of both intrauterine and extrauterine pregnancies. This gestational sac is in the normal location inside the uterine cavity, whereas this gestational sac is around the cervical region. This is an abnormal location. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam, and today we will differentiate between normal pregnancy and a miscarriage a normal intrauterine pregnancy consists of a gestational sac containing a yolk sac which is a circular structure with an echoic or hypoechoic center and a hyperechoic border and an embryo containing a heartbeat that is usually between 110 to 170 beats per minute. The heartbeat usually reaches approximately 170 beats per minute at around 9 to 10 weeks of gestational age. We can use the M mode to measure the heart rate of the embryo here we can see the heart rate is 144 beats per minute which is within normal range a miscarriage is the natural termination of pregnancy before 20 weeks the first type is the threatened miscarriage it has many features on ultrasound the first one is fetal bradycardia the heart rate will be below 80 or 90 beats per minute in this image it is 75 beats per minute 
This feature is just a suspicion. It is not a confirmation that the pregnancy has failed. The next feature is related to the size of the gestational sac that is a small mean sac diameter. Now in normal cases the mean sac diameter must be at least 5 millimeters greater than the crown rump length, the CRL. The embryo must be visible when the MSD crosses 25 millimeters. But over here you can see the embryo as well as the yolk sac but the gestational sac is very small. The MSD is only 7.7 millimeters. The gestational sac looks crowded. The next feature is an irregular gestational sac. In the normal case, the gestational sac is very smooth, but in this case, the inner walls are irregular. The next feature is a calcified yolk sac that measures greater than 7 millimeters. A normal yolk sac is circular with an anechoic or a hypoechoic center and a hyperechoic rim and the diameter is usually less than 6 millimeters and the calcified yolk sac is hyperechoic and may have posterior shadowing. A subchorionic hematoma appears as a hypoechoic area between the uterine wall and the chorion. It is due to bleeding and is often crescentic shaped. An expanded amnion sign is another feature of threatened miscarriage in which the embryo without a heartbeat is surrounded by amnion. Normally at this stage it has a heartbeat but this feature is not a sure sign of a failed pregnancy just as a threatened miscarriage is not a sure sign of a failed pregnancy. It has a 50% chance of recovery. So we must wait and watch and evaluate further on serial scans. A missed miscarriage occurs when there are no clinical symptoms such as vaginal bleeding but it has some ultrasound features. The first one is an empty gestational sac when there is no yolk sac or embryo seen even when the MSD is greater than 25 millimeters. The second feature is CRL greater than 7 millimeters with no heartbeat. Unfortunately, in this image, there is no heartbeat detected in the embryo. We must wait and watch as it can recover on further scans. In an inevitable miscarriage, the internal os is open and the gestational sac is seen at the lower portion of the uterus. Usually the gestational sac is seen over here. In this image you can see a change in the shape and the location of the gestational sac. On repeated scans the gestational sac can be seen changing its position and moving downwards and also may change its shape. And the embryonic heart rate may also be absent in an inevitable miscarriage. A complete miscarriage occurs when all the fetal parts and pregnancy tissue have been expelled completely from the uterus 
and the uterus is empty and in an incomplete miscarriage there will be retained products of conception left behind in the uterus they can be fetal parts or or some remaining placental tissue they can be of mixed echogenicity hello everyone this is dr sam and this video is about postpartum ultrasound postpartum findings are features seen in the uterus after delivery on the left side is a normal uterus without any recent pregnancy this is the normal size echo texture and shape of the uterus without any setting of pregnancy and on the right side is a one day postpartum uterus that is the uterus appearance one day after delivering the baby the uterus is enlarged by comparing it with the normal uterus we can see it is much bigger in size the endometrial canal can have hyperechoic bright areas some of these areas are due to blood clots and some hyperechoic areas can have dirty posterior shadowing this gray shadowing indicates that there is air present in the endometrial canal the air may last up to 3 weeks these features are normal postpartum features in a uterus here is an image taken after a recent delivery it is an early stage postpartum uterus an enlarged uterus is seen the inner layer of myometrium can be hyperechoic this is another normal appearance of a postpartum uterus this is an image of a second week postpartum uterus it is taken at 8 days after delivery it has decreased in size as compared to the earlier stages but it is still enlarged some endometrial fluid is present this hypoechoic area is fluid and it is due to shedding of the decidua it is also a normal finding on ultrasound retained products of conception refer to retained placental tissue or fetal tissue in the uterus after a delivery or miscarriage mostly it is associated with a second trimester miscarriage and placenta accreta fever pelvic pain and abnormal bleeding are suggestive of rpoc that is retained products of conception or endometritis a retained placenta will appear as a hyperechoic mass in the endometrial cavity we can see this large hyperechoic mass and the uterus is enlarged as well this mass seen along with the clinical symptoms can help in diagnosis this image is compared with the normal postpartum appearance of uterus here is another image of a retained placenta a hyperechoic mass is seen in the endometrial canal with the patient suffering from fever pelvic pain and abnormal bleeding this is a transverse view of a retained placenta we can see an enlarged uterus with a hyperechoic mass in the endometrial canal these are transvaginal views of postpartum uterus and rpoc Here we see some hyperechoic areas with some dirty shadowing which means there is air present this is a normal appearance and over here we have rpoc there is a hyperechoic mass with calcification this black shadowing is clean shadowing which confirms that this is a calcification calcified areas indicate that it is indeed a retained placenta and is helpful in diagnosis rpoc can be classified based on doppler analysis 
This classification is called Gutenberg classification. This is type 0 RPOC. It is a hyperechoic mass without any internal vascularity. No Doppler signal is found within the mass. In type 1 RPOC, heterogeneous echoes with minimal or no vascularity are seen. We can see blood flow here and some mixed echoes are seen here. In type 2 RPOC, high vascularity is seen within the hyperechoic mass. There is no blood flow seen outside this mass. Type 3 RPOC has highly vascular mass and highly vascular endometrium. Large blood flow is seen within the mass as well as in endometrium. Arteriovenous malformation is rare but can occur after a miscarriage or dilation and curettage or any uterine injury. It presents with heavy vaginal bleeding and is a serious condition. It is an abnormal connection between the arteries and the veins without a capillary bed. On ultrasound, anechoic cystic tubular areas are seen in myometrium. Here is another image showing arteriovenous malformation. Multiple cystic tubular areas are seen in the myometrium. On color Doppler, these cystic areas will be hypervascular. We will see a low resistance, high velocity flow with a resistive index between 0.2 to 0.5. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and this video is about C-section uterus ultrasound. These are longitudinal transvaginal images of the uterus after a caesarean section. These curvilinear hyperechoic structures are the sutures. And over here, this is a uterine wound. It appears as a focal hypoechoic area at the site of the incision. These appearances are normal after a C-section. Here is an image of a normal caesarean scar. It can appear as a hyperechoic line at the site of the incision in the myometrium. Also, the endometrium will be deviated towards the scar. On the right side is another image of a C-section scar. There is a focal hypoechoic or anechoic area with some fluid and the deviation of endometrium is greater here. These are the appearances of a caesarean scar. A bladder flap hematoma refers to a collection of blood between the bladder wall and uterus which can occur after a C-section. The bladder is present here, anterior to the uterus. This hematoma will be heterogeneous with solid and fluid filled areas. If it gets infected, gas will be seen. We will see dirty gray posterior shadowing in case of gas. Here is a transabdominal image of bladder flap hematoma. The hematoma is present between the bladder wall and the uterus. This is another image of a normal caesarean scar. It is a hypoechoic line in the myometrium. In a caesarean scar niche, there will be a hypoechoic defect in the myometrium at the site of the caesarean scar due to tethering of endometrium. Blood has accumulated in this defect. The defect has various shapes. This is an irregular shaped defect. This defect has a linear shape. Endometrial fluid is also present. In this image, there is a large accumulation of endometrial fluid. This defect has a teardrop shape. Triangular shaped defects are common as well. 
we can see a proper triangular shaped defect here. Caesarean scar pregnancy is very rare. It is a type of ectopic pregnancy, but it is not an accurate term because the gestational sac is still implanted within the uterus. The gestational sac is present in the caesarean scar. Here is another image of a caesarean scar pregnancy. We can see the embryo very clearly here. This is a transabdominal image of a caesarean scar pregnancy. The gestational sac is seen within the caesarean scar. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and this video is about congenital uterine abnormalities on ultrasound. Congenital uterine abnormalities occur during embryonic life. These are types of Mullerian duct anomalies. These are transabdominal images of the uterus. On the left side is a transverse image of a normal uterus. We can see the normal myometrium and normal endometrial canal. This is the bladder anterior to the uterus. Over here is uterus didelphis, in which there is a complete duplication of uterus. We see two separate uteri with two separate endometrial canals. There is no connection between them. Also, there will be a large fundal cleft which will be present at this location. The fundal cleft is seen better on a 3D ultrasound coronal image. Here we have transvaginal images in transverse plane. This is the normal uterus and this is uterus didelphis. We can see two separate uteri and two separate endometrial canals. These are transverse images of the cervix taken transvaginally. Here is the normal cervix. And over here we have two separate cervices as well. Because there is complete duplication of uterus, so that's why there are two cervices. These are 3D reconstructed coronal images of the uterus. This view is best for diagnosing congenital uterine malformations. This is how a normal uterus looks like in a coronal 3D ultrasound image. And here we have two separate uteri. There is complete duplication of the uterus and cervix. In a bicornuate uterus, the uterine horns are widely divergent and there is usually a single cervix. The uterine contour is heart shaped in a bicornuate uterus. It is either heart shaped or concave shaped. There is a concave shaped indentation here. This is a 3D coronal view of a bicornuate uterus. We can clearly see a heart shaped uterine contour. The fundal cleft has a depth greater than 1 cm. The uterine horns are widely divergent. The angle between the uterine horns will be an obtuse angle. It will be greater than 105 degrees. Both uterine horns are connected to a single cervix. A unicornuate uterus will have only one uterine horn connected to only a single fallopian tube. It is difficult to see it on 2D ultrasound. We may see tilting of the uterus to one side in the pelvis. A unicornuate uterus has a banana shape. Unicornuate uterus is seen very well in a 3D coronal image. Only a single uterine horn is found. We can see the banana shaped uterus tilted to one side. In a septate uterus, the endometrial stripe is separated by a septum at the fundus. This is the septum in transverse view. You can see that it has divided the endometrial stripe. This septum is isoechoic to the myometrium. 
Here is another transverse image of a septic uterus. An isoechoic septum is seen separating the endometrium. Here we can see a septate uterus in coronal view. We can see a thick isoechoic septum in the middle of the uterine cavity. There will be an acute angle formed at the fundal indentation right here. And the depth of this indentation will be greater than 1.5 centimeters. The uterine fundal contour is convex shaped here. It can be flat as well. An arcuate uterus is the least serious type of congenital uterine abnormality. The transverse diameter of uterine cavity is increased and a small indentation is present at the fundus. It measures less than 1 cm. An obtuse angle is formed at the fundal indentation right here. An arcuate uterus is actually considered a normal variant of uterus and has very less association with reproductive failure. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and in this video we will learn how to measure ovarian volume. The formula for measuring ovarian volume is as follows 0.52 into length into width into depth. All these values will be in centimeters. These are transvaginal images. The measurements are more accurate in this approach. We take two measurements in the longitudinal view. The longest measurement is the length. One caliper is placed at the superior edge of the ovary and the other caliper is placed at the inferior edge of the ovary. The second measurement is the depth. One caliper is placed at the anterior margin of the ovary and the second caliper is placed at the posterior margin of the ovary. The third measurement is taken in the transverse view, that is the width. An example of ovarian volume is given here. 0 0.52 into a length of 3.4 cm multiplied by a width of 3.4 cm multiplied by a depth of 1.5 cm. These values correspond to average size of the ovary. This gives us a volume of 6.36 milliliters or cubic centimeters. Volume of the ovary can vary amongst individuals due to age, different body size and height. These are transabdominal images of the ovary. This is the bladder. This will be the length and this will be the depth. This image is in transverse view. The calipers are placed horizontally to measure the width. Ovarian volume is the largest in women under 30 years. An approximate volume is around 14 to 15 milliliters but it can even go as high as 25 milliliters. Also, there can be a significant difference in volume between the normal right and left ovary. In women between 30 to 40 years of age, the volume may be around 30 milliliters approximately. Volume starts to decrease with advancing age. In women between 41 to 50 years of age, the volume can be around 11 milliliters. This image shows both the ovaries in transverse view. For women between 51 to 60 years of age, the volume is around 5 to 6 milliliters. And for women above 60 years, the volume can be around 4 to 5 milliliters. Here are more 
transvaginal images showing measurements of ovary. These are the length and the depth. And this is the width being taken in transverse view. These images are transabdominal images with caliper placements for length, depth, and width of the ovary. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and today we will talk about ovarian pathologies on ultrasound. We will compare the normal and abnormal appearances of ovaries. Starting off with the normal views of left ovary. In the longitudinal view, it is more wider and has multiple follicles. And in the transverse view, it is taller. We can see the follicles inside the ovary. Similarly, for the right ovary, both the longitudinal and transverse views with follicles visualized. Starting off with the first case, ovarian cyst. These are anechoic, rounded, thin walled with posterior enhancement and they are usually more than 3 cm in diameter. Humulus uforus is a small cystic structure at the periphery of this dominant follicle and it is a sign of ovulation. Corpus luteum is formed after the ovum is expelled into the fallopian tube and it is a thick walled structure. By using Doppler, we observe peripheral vascularity. This peripheral vascularity is called the ring of fire. And we can also have internal echoes which are inside the corpus luteum. A hemorrhagic ovarian cyst can occur from rupture of a corpus luteum or any other functional cyst. It has internal echoes due to blood products and absence of flow on Doppler. Hemorrhagic corpus luteum showing peripheral vascularity that is the ring of fire and it also has internal echoes due to blood products. Endometriomas, also known as chocolate cysts, have unilocular appearance. U unilocular means single compartment. These locules are compartments. So this one has only one compartment and it has thick walls. And these internal echoes like ground glass appearance and it has cystic solid components this one is cystic slightly lower in echogenicity and this is the solid component slightly more in echogenicity serous cyst adenomas have anechoic appearance and are unilocular this is again uh, one compartment so this is called unilocular and this one is anechoic as compared to the endometrioma which was not anechoic serous cystadenocarcinoma is the malignant form it is comprised of heterogeneous appearance and more solid components and the patient may also have ascites. Mucinous cyst adenoma is larger in size and has lots of locules. There are many locules in this. Mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma is the malignant form and has more het solid components and heterogeneous components. The walls of the locules are more hyperechoic. Dermoid cysts are also called mature ovarian cystic teratomas are echogenic masses with attenuation and they also have fluid fluid levels. These are two different fluids 
with different densities. The dermoid plug, also called rocky-density nodule, is a hyperchoic structure due to hair, tooth, sebaceous or calcific component. It is more likely to be malignant. The dermoid mesh is formed from here inside a cyst. And this form gives a dot dash pattern. These are thin echogenic bands which give this type of appearance. Another feature is the floating ball sign which are fat globules inside the cyst. These are hyperechoic fat globules inside a hypoechoic fluid. Ovarian fibroma is a benign tumor of the ovary. It is a solid hypoechoic mass which may sometimes have cysts. Ovarian tachoma is another benign tumor of the ovary but it is non-specific on ultrasound and has variable appearance. Metastases appear as solid hypoechoic masses in the ovary which give a specific moth-eaten appearance. They appear as these hole-like structures and this type of metastatic lesions are also known as Krokenberg tumor. Paraovarian cysts are simple cysts outside the ovary and they move independently when transducer pressure is applied. Polycystic ovary occurs when there are more than 20 cysts inside an ovary and the follicle size can range from 2 to 9 millimeters. Due to multiple cysts, this gives a specific appearance called the string of pearls sign. Here we have the string of pearls sign. The cysts are lined up together and they look just like this pearl, string of pearl. In ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the ovaries are enlarged, which could be more than 12 centimeters. They have lots of cysts, and these cysts give a spoke wheel appearance. In ovarian torsion, the ovary can appear enlarged, could be more than 4 cm. There will be absence of blood flow on Doppler. Here we can see there is no blood flow inside the ovary when the Doppler is applied. And the ovary is appearing hyperechoic as well. A classic sign of ovarian torsion is the whirlpool sign. Because the ovary is twisted, it gives us this type of appearance and this appearance is called the whirlpool sign. Using Doppler makes the whirlpool sign more prominent. As you can see the shape of the, the structure is looking just like the whirlpools that we see in water. Another important sign which might be noticed in some cases of ovarian torsion is the follicular ring sign. It is a thick hyperechoic margin around the follicles which can measure 1 to 2 millimeters. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and in this video we will learn how to measure cervical length. Cervical length is the distance between internal os and external os. This length is often measured in the setting of pregnancy. The transvaginal approach is the most accurate approach for measuring cervical length. The cervix is seen in longitudinal view. One caliper is placed at internal os right here. This junction that is towards the fetus in the left half of the image and the other caliper is placed right here at the external os. This bright line 
is the endometrium. The external os will be where endometrium ends. The normal cervical length is around 4 cm till 37 weeks gestation. In twin pregnancies, it can be around 3 cm or less at 32 weeks. This is a transabdominal view. Cervical length can also be taken in a transabdominal view, but it is not accurate because the full bladder often leads to an increased value of cervical length. This is the internal os right here. One caliper is placed here. And this is external os. The other caliper is placed here. Here are more images showing measurement of cervical length. On the left side is a transvaginal approach with calipers placed for measurement of cervical length. And on the right side is a transabdominal approach. This is the bladder and this is amniotic fluid. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and this video is about cervix ultrasound. The cervix is the lower end of the uterus. It is often overlooked when scanning, but it is important to view it. These are transvaginal images of the cervix in longitudinal view. The internal loss is the junction between the body of the uterus and the cervix. It is the upper part of the cervix and will be seen on the left side in the image. The external loss is the junction between the cervix and the vagina. It will be seen on the right side in the image. And this area between the internal loss and the external loss is the endocervical canal. In this image, we can see some fluid in the endocervical canal. Nebothian cysts are benign cysts and usually occur after the cervix heals from chronic cervicitis. We will see anechoic cysts near the endocervical canal. Some cysts may have internal echoes. On color Doppler, we will not see any internal flow. We can see three cysts here. Here is another image showing a single Nebothian cyst near the endocervical canal. Dilated endocervical glands will have a multicystic tubular appearance. This appearance is also called cystic endocervical mucus. You can see a difference in appearance of the cervical canal. Cervical polyp refers to a well-defined circumscribed mass within the endocervical canal. A polyp is attached to the wall of the cervix with a stalk, but this stalk is hard to see on ultrasound. This mass can appear either hyperechoic or hypoechoic, but mostly it is hyperechoic to the myometrium. This is another case of a cervical polyp. It is a well circumscribed round hyperechoic mass in the cervix. A fibroid can also be found in the cervix. It will appear hypoechoic mostly, but it can also appear isoechoic or hyperechoic and even heterogeneous. In cervical incompetence, the cervix becomes dilated and this can cause second trimester pregnancy failure. The cervical loss will be open and become widened. This widening is called funneling. This is due to bulging of fetal membranes into the internal cervical loss. The appearance of the cervical loss can have an hourglass appearance. It looks like this. In severe cases, fetal parts or even the umbilical cord may also be found in the cervix. Here is another image of cervical incompetence. This is the dilated cervix and this is funneling. Cervical length is the distance between internal and external os. It is measured by placing one caliper on the 
internal loss and the other caliper on the external loss. The normal cervical length is around 4 cm till 37 weeks and less than 3 cm at 32 weeks for twin pregnancies. A short cervix is suggestive of cervical incompetence. The cervical length will be less than 2.5 cm. Visually, we can see that the cervix here is much shorter than the cervix in the normal image. And this is the fetal head. Cervical stenosis is the abnormal narrowing of the cervix. On ultrasound, it is difficult to diagnose it, but we may see some endometrial fluid and a large fluid collection with internal echoes in the endocervical canal. Cervical cancer is also difficult to see on ultrasound and sonography is not reliable for it. If the mass is large enough, we may see an irregularly shaped hypoechoic mass in the cervix. On Doppler, this mass will have internal vascularity. Here power Doppler is used and we can see many areas of vascularity. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and stay tuned for more imaging videos.